And now we'll have a short presentation about the trustworthy human AI interrelations, presented by Arun Sinclair, herself a philosopher and sociologist, currently a senior principal scientist for technology and research, and program director for digital assurance at the DNVGIGL group. Uh, maybe you're coming from Oslo, or is it Spain that very moment? Azun, very much welcome to you for joining this session. Where are you? Thank you very much. I'm actually in Oslo, so I just have put the northern lights. Not that we see them in Oslo, a little bit to, uh, to say that I'm up in the north. It's beautiful. We can all see it. I think everybody wants now to, to go up north where everything seems so be in order. <laughs> so great to have you. Uh, please, let's, let's start with your presentation first, and then we have a Q&A and discussion, and then we'll also include our audience. Azun, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, let me know if you can see the correct uh, presentation in the presentation mode. Can you see it well? Yes, we can see it. Great. Very well. Good. So I wanted to talk about the work that we have been doing on trustworthy industrial AI systems, but I will be um, sort of narrating a little bit the story from, from this, uh, the topic of today, which is uh, um, how we can uh, have uh, trustworthy human AI relations. Um, and then we can unpack more as, uh, as we enter into the discussion. First, how our position uh, so far is that um, uh, we should treat uh, the trustworthiness of AI systems perhaps not in a very different manner than the way in which we demand trustworthiness from a leader or from an expert or even from an organization to whom uh, and to which we delegate our authority to make decisions. If those are technologies that are defined precisely by their capacity to make decisions. So that's a point of departure to sort of uh, pitch on uh, the idea. And the second key point of our position at the moment is that we believe that even with all the complications, AI systems should be subject to the same quality assurance methods and principles that we use for any other technology. Um, what is important to understand when we talk about AI, and I'm sure this has been discussed during this week, is how we define it. Um, we choose to follow the recommendations of the European Commission high-level panel on AI that says AI systems are, are systems that display intelligent behavior by analyzing their environment and taking actions with some degree of autonomy, and those actions will be different in different contexts. But the overarching uh, role is to achieve a specific goal. And what we think is important certainly from an industrial perspective, is to distinguish between two categories of AI systems. First of all, AI-enabled virtual digital assets, but also AI-enabled cyber-physical digital assets. So we can think about uh, providing trust in relationship to a model, but perhaps most importantly, providing trust in relationship to, let's say, an autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicle. Um, and these two categories of assets are important as we think uh, on the conditions for trustworthiness. And we all know that there is a wide debate on AI ethics and on trust in AI, but how do we manage the risk introduced by AI in industrial contexts is a less mature debate. Another issue that we believe is important is distinguishing different types of AI. And I don't want to do a technical talk, but just simply to distinguish, uh, and this is a way to cluster different technologies. On the one hand, we have the traditional software systems or knowledge base. And these are relatively simple, illustrated here by, um, by some coding done by some of my colleagues. And this is very different from, let's say, the experience base, which usually are often uh, referred to as machine learning, where, uh, where the algorithm learns something from the deployment that, they do, that it does and changes behavior as it moves along. And very often the knowledge base and the experience base together is what we see. So in the case of, for example, an autonomous um, uh, vehicle, 
you will find both of them working at the same time and dependent on one another. So very often the mistakes and the trust are not only in relation to machine learning, but also on how the choices made by machine learning affect the knowledge based coding uh, that a system may have. And a third type, which is less used so far, but it is coming and it will come, uh, is reinforcement learning. Um, and these type of models are much more difficult um, to say something about their trustworthiness. So these three different um, types of, uh, of, of AI are important to distinguish as we analyze uh, a particular system. And I will say that the relations with people and the role of people are also going to be different. The key point that I want to make today is that when we talk about artificial intelligence, we think about machines and we forget about the humans, and this is a mistake. Um, we often uh, see autonomy as equal to lack of human intervention and interactions um, and define it as self-directness and self-control. But in reality, uh, autonomy is not really a discrete property of a system, nor even a particular technology in itself most of the time, the time is an interdependence and it's an interdependence between machines and humans. And I believe this is fundamental for this debate about trustworthiness between uh, machines and AI. And the debate on safety of autonomous systems needs to be about how AI is a technology with agency, but at the same time is also an interdependent system. This is probably often forgotten uh, in very technical debates about artificial intelligence and what we need to do in order to assure their safety and trustworthiness to deploy it in society. Trust and ethics are very related. And uh, what is also important is to understand the multidimensional nature of trust. Different stakeholders and different people need different types of evidence in order to trust something. And there are huge differences uh, in the paper. One of the issues we discuss is simply gender differences. Uh, there is empirical evidence that in many countries, men tend to trust um, AI and machines and autonomous cars a lot more than women. But also it's about providing different types of evidence that need to be both technical as well as non-technical. We also know that there is a sprawling AI ethics guidelines, and there is, in fact, a couple of articles that have come up recently that are collecting all the different types of uh, AI guidelines, AI ethics guidelines, and, and the, the ISO Committee, International Standards Organization, also has work uh, of which I'm part, creating a technical paper on AI ethics in society, and a huge debate about responsible AI. But I think it's very important to also understand that ethical issues in here is where the role of people and the trustworthiness between people and machines uh, need to come into play are very often really not necessarily related to technology, but to existing unethical <laughs> context, to existing unethical rules of behavior uh, and existing oppression of which the deployment of AI simply adds on another layer of automating that unfairness. And lastly, there is a major drive to regulate AI impacts on society and at the uh, European level, uh, this is quite clear, but so far there is really not a clear governance, set of governance mechanisms, neither public nor private, but we are likely to see this coming um, as the years come by quite quickly. Another issue that is important in here, uh, again, uh, the relationship between humans and AI is central, is that each sector and the deployment of AI in a particular sector um, will have its, a, its a specificity. And very often what we need is to have a combination of knowledge, uh, digital knowledge, knowledge on machine learning, on AI, but also domain knowledge in order to truly understand uh, the scope of this application. So, for example, in health is uh, quite well known. There are many potential applications in prognosis, diagnostic, therapeutic, therapeutic uh, 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 clinical um, decision support, national, na uh, natural language processing in health informatics, and even administration tools, health outreach, 
information and also triage. And that means that this sector has very specific uh, challenges with unique risk profiles, with systematic uh, data issues, uh, a lot of challenges related to implementation, data access for development and testing, and also uh, complex organizations, responsibilities and incentives. And I will say also a highly regulated field. So we put forward a way to think about these characteristics of trustworthy AI systems following that analogy that I presented at the beginning saying, well, we will demand from these AI systems similar criteria that we do from a leader or from an organization to, who, to which we uh, delegate authority. And we have these um, different types of characteristics. So on the one hand, we will ask the system to be legitimate. Uh, this will be uh, related to data quality. It will be analyzing the suitability of um, the technology vis-a-vis -vis the problem to be solved, questions related to performance, and the need to have risk management and safety uh, plans in place. There will also be the sort of more core technical set of issues related to the ability to perform and the capacity to verify that that performance is fit for purpose. These are issues related to design quality, to data preparation and model training, and to testing and simulation, as well as explainability and also evidence, uh, including identifying sources of evidence to uh, verify that the system is fit for purpose. Human-machine interdependency is also an issue uh, that needs to be looked upon. If uh, an AI system is composed by different types of agents, and as I said, often is interrelation between humans and machines, we need to identify those agents in the system and also identify which roles uh, each agent will have in the deployment or in a particular case. It's just related to communication. Just think about the example um, of the 737 MAX where one of the multiple problems, there were many problems, but one of the multiple problems was a, a miscommunication between the software system and the pilots and one of the key <laughs> issues that Boeing has now put into place has been the training and retraining of pilots which were was not done when the aeroplane that model was um, first launched in the market so that communication uh, between humans and machines is extremely important and also machine to machine interfaces as often we have uh, a constellation of different technologies working together at a more not technical level, uh, we believe it's extremely important to demonstrate the motives and the purpose of deploying uh, technologies that are by themselves risky and prone to misuse. Therefore, we think it's uh, critical to disclose the goals, to disclose the benefits to the stakeholders on taking the risk to deploy these AI systems, and also to understand not only the organizational maturity of those organizations taking part in that deployment, but also questions related to corporate accountability in case something goes wrong. And the last cluster of characteristics of trustworthy AI systems, we believe, is the, the transparency on the impact on the, stake, on the stakeholders. There is, I think, out there becoming now uh, much more robust attempts to generate uh, um, frameworks for impact assessment, um, a way to ascribe responsibility for those actions, very related to uh, the human-machine interdependency and to the identification of the agents and the role. And also the need to provide continuous monitoring in systems that by definition are going to be changing over time. So this time and change perspective is of fundamental importance. In short, we think that um, assuring AI, providing trust, on AI needs to be about a broader view. It's about both product implementation and life cycle processes. It's about the possibility to provide continuous assurance. It's attention to organizational issues and the regulatory environment on particular contexts and knowledge of that regulatory environment. It's about understanding the criticality of the deployment. Um, and is, of course, about societal and ethical issues. 
This, however, doesn't mean we need to be scared in analyzing these systems. In fact, uh, my colleagues in the, in the business um, uh, area of digital solutions in DMBGL have already uh, uh, put in the market a recommended practice, which was the beginning of some of our technical work in the research department. So to summarize, um, we believe that uh, we need to be looking at four interdependent and contained systems at the level of the model, the application, the wider ecosystem, and also society. So for example, at the level of the model, we will be looking at things such as uh, fit for purpose, performance, robustness, bias, interpretability, data issue, and the features of the application. Uh, at the application level, we will be looking at questions related to legitimacy, agency and roles, human interfaces, the monitoring of the changes, uh, modularization, security issues, and also the business case of which this deployment um, uh, uh, applies. And then we, need, we think we need to look wider into the ecosystem uh, that this model and this particular application uh, impacts upon by having a clear understanding of who are all the stakeholders, mapping of agents, defining the roles, the interoperability, questions of standards. In many cases, we should also take into account questions related to sustainability and environmental impact in many critical issues, but also in many business contexts. Uh, if uh, the operation of uh, a particular AI application is important for a system to function, then we will need to have in place redundancy systems. We always should look into potential unintended use and definitely the organizational maturity of those involved. And lastly, we should always look at the context of society in relation to law and regulations, ethical issues, fairness, systemic bias, job displacement, displacement, which is important not only at the societal level, but it's also important in the context of a particular company that is using and deploying these systems, asking questions as to whether this is going to lead to job, job displacement or whether what it really requires is a retraining for that trustworthy uh, human machine interface. Effects on users on a large scale, I think we have Lots of uh, unfortunate examples uh, of this not being considered, and obviously the potential for misuse at a larger scale. So this was my presentation, and I look uh, forward very much uh, to engage in a conversation with you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing such a broad view with us, because that gives us now the opportunity to sort of dig a little bit deeper to specifics. And I also would like to thank you because I think you rightly so put the human factor in the right context in its relation to tech and the machines. And that relationship is exactly, I think, what is some people concerned about and others are very much into the debate. Where will that lead us? Let me start with health and the health care. Uh, I think you rightly so mentioned that there is a very complex system. And we all uh, sort of experienced throughout this year. And just to give you an example, in Germany, I think we, we felt that tech was one side, but how to bring it to the personalities, to the persons, and how to sort of use all the data necessary. And then we found out that we had some severe malfunctions, using data, not having enough data, or as you said, the complexity of the levels federal government, state government, communalities, where there was also a lack of coordination. And I think that experience brings us to the question, what lessons should be learned from that? What practical things we can take away which would better use AI in the whole health management and health explanation system? Could you give us some hints? Thank you very much for that question. I'm certainly not an expert on AI in the healthcare sector, uh, but I, I have something to say in regards to that. I think my, my first point will be that very often in the drive that we have to automate, uh, we forget that there are many things that cannot be automated. 
and human common sense cannot be substituted uh, by an algorithm. And, and I think that uh, very often we forget this sort of basic fundamental um, um, uh, insight. On the other hand, I believe also that we tend to be over optimistic as to what uh, these automated systems can do and cannot do. And we rush into their implementation without analyzing properly whether we have the necessary data to allow us to, uh, to, 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 to see whether really um, the system will be fit for purpose. In many of the cases, we are in completely new territory. And I believe that one of the areas of research that are most important is to create simulations that can allow us to see um, how potential uh, errors may come and to learn from those errors. So I think that um, the COVID-19 crisis has actually been uh, a reason for scrolling uh, and speeding up digitalization on all senses, sometimes for good, the possibility that we have to communicate, but sometimes not very well thought through. And I think that in our desire to put to use this, um, this, uh, these tools, we have forgotten to do the basics. Do they violate our privacy? Do we have, again, the quality of data necessary uh, to do that? So I think uh, <laughs> the lesson to me is that we need to, to slow down and, 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 and do one step at a time rather than um, rushing into uh, the deployment of the systems in, in things that are so critical. And again, never to substitute um, human common sense and definitely never to substitute the importance of uh, defining how to align goals. Uh, like for example, will be the case of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of problems related to different scales of government. Um, we, we, should not, we should not yet entrust these AI systems to hugely critical tasks until we have a lot more experience on what can go wrong and how can we prevent it. Azun, thank you very much. You, you just said that uh, we, we should do one step after the other, not rush it too much. But you know, and we know, all of us, that patience is not a political virtue and the expectations of the public are very high as far as speedy forward going. And coming to the legitimacy, which also was one of the topics we were touching on, Le the legitimacy of AI is put by many in doubt because they are fearing it more than they are embracing it. They have anxieties about it, outbursts and outcome, and you just mentioned it as well. So as a sociologist, what advice could you give to overcome that lack of legiti le legitim <laughs> legitimacy, what, how to overcome it and how to work with the public and the public mind? in education, in trying to get their anxiety level down and, and address it, what could be done, should be done? Thank you very much for that question. I think it's fundamental. So, so, so one, one very important thing is that the first thing we need to do is to understand exactly what are those anxieties. So we need a lot more sociological research uh, on what is what the public thinks about these technologies. At the same time, we also know, like in the case of many new technologies, there is a lot of misperception because not everything is as bad as it is perceived. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are huge uh, scary risks and scary things out there in the media. And the media is portraying the scary part rather than the good part. So I think what we have is to bridge the gap of an over-optimistic, very fast deployment of these technologies in society and in, and in issues that are important for society. And at the same time, we need to educate um, um, the people as to exactly what the problems are, because not everything is about the, the average citizen, I will say, uh, even in Europe, really doesn't distinguish uh, between the, the concept of uh, super intelligence versus artificial intelligence as being just a machine learning uh, usual application that is a matter of uh, uh, simple, very fast calculations um, and that we use them all the time. 
um, in, in, in many different cases. So we need both um, education about those misperceptions, um, education about what are the technical capabilities today versus the big uh, problematic applications, while at the same time also educating the public that the step to take between one regular application and misuse is actually quite easy. So, so we definitely need to have that ethical layer uh, and, and the need for um, jointly producing the necessary regulatory regime, both public governance and also private governance at the level of standards and so on, as we mature these applications. But we need sociological research and, and, and not only um, technical issues like explainability and this and that. We need to understand what the public uh, thinks in order to then uh, correct what can be misperceptions uh, of the capabilities of the technologies today. Because there is also quite a lot of uh, mistrust that is unfounded. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, uh, leap of faith, too much, too much faith on what these uh, technologies can achieve. And, and, and we all need to be a little bit more pragmatic as to where we are today. And we are not in the super intelligence. From pragmatic to, to, an, uh, to a, a topic which you are very much uh, trying to address in your work, which is the context of industrial systems and AI. Uh, the relation of uh, the workforce and the people working in that environment and AI. And we heard the beginning of the week from Jana Köhler that there might be problems if the data is flawed or not sufficient enough in sort of that relationship that could be either led to misperceptions or also to male functions. So data and the, the quality of data and who is in control of the data and how it is fed in to the system is a very important and a very fundamental one. Is that right? Does that need a better balance, a better control? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, issues of data quality and understanding the limitations of existing data sets for a particular application is the, the point of departure. You may remember the circular set of characteristics that I presented. Data quality is number one. Uh, but then on the other hand, I think it's, uh, it's also important to, um, to distinguish that, um, that we have quite a lot of existing unfair <laughs> and unbalanced uh, data sets, and that is less, uh, le less known. Um, and yet, at the same time, the world has huge, enormous amounts of data that we really, really don't know uh, how to handle them. So it's, 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 balancing, it's balancing both. But data quality is uh, key, but so is model training uh, to understand how to use the data. You were talking about all the time, or we were talking all the time about the interaction, which certainly plays an important role in the future. But also there are expectations to what AI can do or what it shouldn't do. So how to meet best the expectations of the end users? Does, there, does that mean there is a, a, a continuous need for a dialogue between tech, end users, and sort of... Uh, yeah, the ones in control of the whole system. I think that in order to have this dialogue to be meaningful, uh, and going back to talking about training, we also need, I mean, you know, we need to train um, the software developers and the ML experts and AI experts on understanding the wider world, right? But also we need to be pragmatic in that we cannot demand from one single person to have, let's say, very narrow, high level technical capabilities and at the same time be in a trained ethicist. So we need a combination of things to happen in order to have that chain of information uh, to prevent uh, the, the, the misuse. Um, so I, I don't think there is one easy solution to that except the awareness that we need to train those who, um, who, who create the systems, but the creation of the systems need to be populated uh, by 
uh, teams of, uh, of of different of different capabilities. So you need interdisciplinarity uh, from an academic perspective. You need interdisciplinarity to be extremely present. You need uh, you need teams that have people with different insights uh, that can see the sort of uh, robustness at the technical level, the problems with the data, and then you will need somebody who is much more aware of the user interface. This is quite common in software development, the, the user experience. But here, I think we need to go two steps further into, into that user experience in the sense that we need to create a feedback, feedback loop and to what didn't work and also how it was misused um, and, and misinterpreted. But Arzun, let me put it a little bit in another way. It's not only about misuse, it's also about non-use at all. Let me put it that way. Sometimes one could have the impression that tech is producing applications, offerings, and, and sort of things, trying to address things which they think are meeting the expectations of the con consumer or the people. And the people stands in front of it and says, I don't know how, either how to handle it, or if I really need it, or if that is really meeting, meeting my standards or what I need to know. And so far, there can be miscommunication. And can that be changed? Yeah, I think I understand what you are saying now, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure it's only miscommunication because I think this push for putting things in the market is because uh, a lot of the uh, the big push on, 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 on these technologies comes from a handful of companies that are competing with each other in the market uh, to put out things without really seeing is this good, uh, is it needed uh, by society. So I, I, maybe, maybe I'm not seeing that. So, so, so I will question, do we really need this? Um, it, I think it boils down to a, a one directional push. Uh, again, a handful of companies dominating this, uh, the creation and, and maturity of these technologies um, to put to use that things that may not be relevant. Whereas on the other hand, I believe one of the most important opportunities is to, is to do the other way around, not necessarily from the people or the user towards, towards those who create the technologies, but understanding to what are the key societal issues that uh, artificial intelligence can help us solving that until now we may have not been able to solve. So you can have the example of um, an, an interesting debate happening in the field of climate change today, right? Um, so it's, it's getting at that level, I think, what is important. Uh, until now, most of the things we see are related to Again, handful of companies putting things in the market, and with the push for consumerism uh, or, or, or or issues like that, rather than looking into what does the world need? What if we have these wonderful technologies? How can we actually leverage them to solve problems that matter uh, to society and, and to people? You just I'm not sure I have answered your question. <laughs> you just mentioned climate change, which is one of the largest problems we are all facing. And your company has endorsed the statement of sustainability in digital age. Uh, it argues that tackling the climate crisis and achieving a broader sustainability goal is indivisible from creating a sure, secure, equitable and trusted digital world. So here is the precondition which needs to be managed and be there before we can solve the larger problem of climate change. So there's an interdependence. What is the way, the right way to move forward on that issue? Well, I mean, you are referring to the to the Montreal Declaration yes. uh, that we signed uh, together with other people. And I was part of the team that, that, that did the research uh, um, related to this, um, which is all about a call for making sure that we leverage technologies in general, but very much digital technologies to serve democratic issues. I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges of our generation together with um, solving climate change and perhaps one is dependent on the other uh, because solving climate change also requires uh, uh, well-functioning uh, democracies. And, and, and Soshana Suvov, uh, the, the American author, um, really 
that wrote the surveillance uh, capitalism. I think she, she says it very clearly, and I had a wonderful opportunity to actually interview her, and, and she said it. We need to put digital technologies and definitely intelligent technologies like AI at the service of democracy, rather working against it. And in, and in doing so, we'll create a system where, where we can confidently um, elaborate and, 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 and have the basis for, for, for the needed debate on, on what are the steps to take. Um, in relationship to sustainability, I mean, many, many, climate, for example, many of these topics are heavily data driven, right? Uh, you look at uh, climate information. So it's heavily data driven. Uh, and we have the opportunity to get insights from this data that we didn't before. In fact, understanding climate modeling, modeling is impossible without the role of supercomputers. It has always been technology mediated. Um, so we have a great opportunity here to do that, but we are not doing enough. Uh, the vast majority of, of the applications that we see, again, uh, to my mind, I think are, uh, they, they started with, uh, with uh, teaching consumers, uh, telling you what to buy, uh, selecting your, your priority, your, your most, uh, your preferred list of books, what should be the next uh, um, movie or film that you, you should be seeing. And I think it's thinking along the lines of how can we use these technologies to tell us something that is much more important than what is our next uh, Netflix um, um, show to watch. Where, 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 where the challenge lies. And, and, and it requires democratizing. And, and part of democratizing is also communicating with the public, educating young people, educating uh, policymakers uh, and, and, and bureaucrats and, and, and everybody as to what are the, the, the potential good things and the potential misuse of these technologies rather than keep pushing them. So, Azon, we talked a lot about current challenges as well as challenges ahead of us. Let me challenge you as a sociologist and philosopher. Uh, we always sort of uh, see that uh, moral and ethic questions are sort of either lagging behind the technical developments or not sort of being focused enough and not maybe also not debated enough. So, let me ask you about industry, the standards on ethic and fairness in machine learning algorithms, there are some voluntary guidelines in some aspects of industry, and there's also an OECD list of guideline, uh, guidelines which is not mandatory. So, as a philosopher and sociologist, where are your biggest concerns about deviating two different paths, leaving in different directions? Well, actually, what I think very interesting, I ha, uh, as a philosopher and in, in, in my earlier work, when I was in academia, I, lead, I, I did quite a lot of uh, work on applied ethics. And the problem was always the same, that the ethical considerations came after, right? So you frame something and then you think about the ethics. But I believe that actually the liveliness of the current debate that we see on, on artificial intelligence has put the ethical questions quite at the core and quite early on. Again, I'm thinking that we are early on in this uh, in this um, in this journey. Um, so, so for example, in terms of industry, industry standards, the International Standards Organization ISO has a committee, committee SC42, about AI, and it has many different sets of working groups and touches on, upon many topics. Uh, there is a working group on trustworthy AI, and as part of that, there is a central piece uh, that is in the making uh, on, the, on the ethical and societal issues. And it cross cuts to many of the, of the standards that are being done in other parts of this committee. So I'm not saying it's perfect, but what I'm saying is that precisely because it's so scary and <laughs> the consequences of surveying populations or deploying, automating uh, uh, um, um, uh, weapons uh, are, are so problematic and also the, the more sort of existential uh, problem of having machines 
eventually ruling over the human race is so, uh, so scary that this has led to a very lively debate early on in this technology. So I, I, I think this is an interesting um, development. And what is important is that we continue along these lines, that it continues to remain part of mm -hmm. the conversation. And, and I believe it is part of the conversation and it should remain uh, part of the conversation because um, we are never going to end solving the potential ethical issues as we move along and we learn from experience and uh, the technologies are applied to different areas. They're always going to come uh, new ethical dilemmas and, 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 and eventually training the big companies, the big tech companies, um, they're all concerned about that. Sometimes not sufficiently, but, but they are. And that it tells you that, um, that the topic is alive and it's alive early on in, 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 the, in the maturing and the deploying of the, of the technology. Azun, one very last question. Yeah. <laughs> Azun, one last question, I think, which also plays a very important role in the processes or the process you just outlined is risk management. Uh, use the, the abilities and also the tools of risk management to get better results. Uh, if I ask you a question in this direction, what technologies are sort of needing risk management as far as their quick approach or even their accelerating speech is concerned in the field of AI? All of them. All of them. Uh, Good answer. <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, you need to, uh, the, some of the work we are doing uh, right now is related to assurance of complex and intelligent systems. So even without AI, we have technological capabilities that have led to things that are so complex, very often nobody understands. Uh, if you think about um, 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 the way in which uh, control systems and, and, and deployment of software into um, boats or aeroplanes or cars, uh, this has been coming uh, uh, for, for a long time, but now we are in, in making these this machines complicated also because there are systems where you have many different organizations providing different bits and pieces and, 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 and complex uh, and intelligent systems do have emergent properties, meaning that um, the risk becomes an emergent, the safety becomes an emergent property. Um, therefore, I, I believe <laughs> that, that, that having clear risk management plans in place is, a, is an absolutely uh, a sine qua non condition for any of these uh, complex and intelligent systems. More so when in addition, we add that additional layer of complexity and uncertainty, which is uh, these new technologies who can make decisions on, on their own and very often are very difficult to understand to the human mind. Let's don't forget that many of those, um, you know, I spoke about the three types and perhaps more the last two than the first, are often referred to as black box systems. Um, so, so all of them is my answer. Well Thank you very much, Azun, because uh, you very well outlined the complexity of the whole issue. Now I come to a very simple thing, a very simple task, just saying thank you to you, which is simple, but I think it comes from my heart. It was very enlightening. And I think in the interest of all of our uh, people watching us, uh, thank you to you and the Nordic light behind you, which we want to keep as one of the beauties in the world of a safe and secure climate and environment. We want to keep it. We want to thank you. And all of your audience, please come back in five minutes. Sharp 440. Thank you very much. Thank you, Azun. Thank you.